So our first day and our very first scene was the moment when Nolan uh, goes back to a, a childhood play area deep in the woods. The very first scene was Taylor alone um, as Nolan trying to understand what his dreams were telling me, coming back to a childhood spot, trying to remind himself of what used to make him happy. Please, don't let him get to you, Nolan. And then Sam rears his ugly head and then reminds him, hey buddy, I'm still here to F your day up. <laughs> now I was having some trouble coming up with new ideas of ways to surprise you, but I think this one was pretty good. It was a great first day and, and sort of a nice ease into production. Fairly simple scene, um, an important scene, but you know, a fairly simple one. Day two, <laughs> because apparently I'm an asshole, uh, was one of the most crucial moments in the film. <laughs> which is the scene where Nolan, uh, running away from Sam, gets to a point in the woods where he sits down and he genuinely contemplates suicide. Um, it's a very important scene, and I'm not laughing because the scene's funny. I'm laughing at the fact that I thought that was a good idea. We have one day to get this right, to figure out the flaws of production and sort of come into our own to understand exactly how we're going to film this thing. And on the second day, uh, I'm going to force you to... <laughs> do the most serious and consequential scene of the film. Sorry guys. From here on out, I'm gonna talk about the production side of this film in a bit of a linear fashion. So discussing um, how the final film looks and sort of going in that order, going a little bit off the rails here and there, really discussing how this entire film was made through the production process. So in the beginning of the film, after we get out of the dream sequence, we sort of get into this monotonous, repetitive, and slightly comfortable schedule that he keeps. He wakes up, he goes to work, he comes back home, he goes to sleep, rinse, repeat. But for Nolan, it's very much comfortable in its repetition because there's no surprises, which then gets completely uprooted because he gets let go from his job. Now he doesn't have that to go to. And he now has to tackle this idea of, hey, now the entire day is just me and me alone with nothing to do. Me alone with my thoughts, me alone with depression. We see Nolan struggling immediately with just being alone with himself. He feels fairly useless because of this fight he's going through and because of this, um, this mindset he, that he's in because he struggles with this very serious mental illness. As well, you see the, the feeling that is a, a massive theme throughout the film for Nolan, which is him feeling like a burden to anyone around him. As he's checking his phone to try and distract himself, his mother calls and he ignores it. He then checks the voicemail. Listen, if you need any money, just let me know. We get a lot of information here because we get to see that you know, A, he, he doesn't want to answer the phone because he's feeling that um, he has nothing to give to her. Um, he has nothing to offer her. He has nothing that he can um, talk about with her. Not because he doesn't want to, but because he does feel like a burden. And we're getting our first hint of that in this scene. But he also feels that um, if he were to open up and say, hey, I lost my job, I need some financial help, or the bigger picture, hey, I'm dealing with this mental illness and I'm dealing with depression and it's really hurting me. He feels like if he opens up about that, it's just gonna, gonna wreck her and he doesn't wanna be the reason that he uh, brings her down, which is all very misplaced feelings. A big thing that the mother mentions in the phone call is that his grandfather has been trying to get a hold of him. This prompts him to go visit the grandfather. He feels a little bit closer to to the grandfather in, in, in a few aspects. I think he feels like he can open up a little bit more with him, at least in his mind. Once he gets there, that all goes at the window and he's sort of back to his, his mask. He's putting on the mask of, oh no, I'm fine. David, who plays the grandfather, was just so giving with this whole process. He actually helped me fix the script. As I said a million times, it's sort of, there were a lot of immature aspects of the film. 
uh, especially the script. David was very helpful in, in helping me fix that uh, for his scenes. But beyond that, he also let us film in his house. I mean, we had no extra money to pay for locations. We had no extra money to pay for anything major. But David was nice enough to say, hey, come to the house, you can film here. Well, there's a stranger. Come in, come on in, don't stand there. You sort of immediately see this excitement that, that Bill has when, when Nolan walks in. He can't contain himself. It, it is genuinely almost childlike. But you also see in a major, major way the, the lie, the big lie that Nolan has in this, in this story. It's been a very, very long time since I've seen a smile on your face. I just want to see you're okay as all. Yeah, I'm fine. Which is absolutely not true. And I think Bill sees that. He used to see him smile. He used to see him play out in the yard. And he's seen that decline over the years. Um, not only with, you know, what he's seen from Nolan, but also what he hasn't seen from Nolan. Not seeing his grandson come over as often as he used to. He knows that something's wrong and it, and it goes past the point of, you know, I'm busy with work, I'm busy with all that. And he, he knows that, okay, my grandson is going through something that I can't quite grasp and he won't quite tell me, but I also don't want to pry too much. There's a struggle on both sides to really honestly look at this. And we really get that in this scene. One of my favorite aspects of this is just this very uncomfortable nature of Nolan being in a house that he's very familiar with, a house that he grew up in, the house that he should feel comfortable in, but he doesn't. And you see him as he's sitting on the couch when his grandfather goes to get him a couple of soft drinks. He's just very uncomfortable in his own skin being in this, this building, this house. And he's really got no reason to be because he should feel comfortable. This is family, this is a safe area, this is a safe zone for him to be in. But he just can't break that feeling of, me being here is a problem. Me being here is a burden to my grandfather. What am I doing? There's a lot of guilt going on within Nolan. And he just feels completely out of place in this place that absolutely welcomes him with open arms. In this, we also start to get the hint that something deeper is, is wrong. That's very apparent when, when Nolan stands up and he sees the photo of his, of his grandmother, who was unfortunately passed. And, and Bill opens up and says, Nolan, if you ever want to talk about your grandmother, I'm here. And Nolan, who's going through a very emotional moment, just says, Thanks. What do you say we start on that stuff upstairs? Yeah. Really showcasing that, that, that deeper, deeper mentality of, of just this fight that he's going through with, with his depression and, and not allowing himself to um, be weak in his mind. You know, he's not weak. He's dealing with something that he can't control. And he's, he's absolutely not a weak person, but in his own mind, he is weak. And, and you can see that in this when he just shields himself from admission. After leaving Bill's house, our original intent was to introduce Ellie in a driving scene as Nolan is going back to his house. The original scene was going to be Nolan is driving. He's sort of dealing with a lot of stuff in his own head. And then he looks out the window and he sees, oh my God, is that who I think it is? That's my childhood friend, Ellie. They lock eyes, they wave to one another, he drives on, and you sort of see a hint of a smile. So it's the first time you see this, this hopeful nature of, of Nolan. The scene, however, uh, presented a ton of challenges, but the biggest aspect of why we changed it, we just completely removed it from the film, is, is story. This scene was just way too damn convenient for the plot. Eventually we have, uh, we have Ellie's introduction later, which I think is much more believable and, and just better overall. So after a quick moment where uh, Nolan comes home and, and he sort of has a moment where he's just watching TV, he then eventually sees something out of the corner of his eye. And then we follow him as he leaves home, um, not wanting to be alone with his own thoughts, not wanting to be alone with his own battles. Um, tonight, he, he decides to go out in public, which is a huge thing for him. It's, it's very tough for him to do that um, because it's easy to stay home and sort of accept whatever's gonna happen and deal with that as it is. And to do something that he feels very vulnerable about, which is just going out in public, uh, it's tough for him, but he just decides, I can't have this fight tonight, so I'm going out. And immediately he regrets it. And then he leans into a crutch, which was supposed to be a much bigger aspect of the film, but we ended up dropping it in the edit just because it didn't fit. Um, and that was him being a smoker. And he, he lights one up on the, on the waterfront to sort of calm himself down. And during that, the light of this film enters the fray, which is Ellie. Hello. How are 
you. This scene was a bit nightmarish, to say the least. Back then, I had the absolute audacity and arrogance to think that filming with no budget, no lights, on a very busy waterfront in Halifax, Nova Scotia was a good idea. It wasn't. <laughs> We hit so many hurdles with this that I'm, I'm sort of amazed the scene came out as well as it did. We had no lights. We had the lamps that were on the waterfront and that was it. On top of that, it was also a very busy night. How are you? It was very hard. <laughs> I believe if I remember correctly, it was the first day of filming. So we had started with the woods scene that worked out really well and then ended the night with this very complicated scene that was very hard to film and accomplish. We got it, but my God, it took a while to get there. Within the scene itself, Ellie's first action after they sort of break the ice and, and Ellie walks up to him and she takes his cigarette, she chucks it away, which is a real hint at, at her place in this entire story. You know, this, this light uh, they came in, in, and her first action is to take something that is harmful away from Nolan's life and flick it away. And then we get into, you know, the big question, what happened? Why did you stop talking to me? Why haven't we talked in a very long time? Are you okay? To which Nolan replies. I just had a rough patch. I'm fine now, though. Trust me. It's just this continuation of the mask um, that, that no one puts on. It, it's very much the theme of the film, um, you know, being afraid to talk about this. And it's why eventually the film went from Unbreakable Chain to Afraid to Speak. I felt like Unbreakable Chain was way too permanent sounding, but Afraid to Speak worked perfectly because of what we see Nolan go through. He is genuinely scared to say, hey, this is what I'm going through. One of the funniest moments of this, if you don't know, Halifax has a party boat that will go through the harbor. You know, you can you can pay to go on it. You have a few drinks, you listen to some music, you, you have a good time. That boat went up and down the harbor, I think four or five times that night to the point where it almost became comedic because it would sort of warn you that it was coming. Uh, it would go down one way and you'd hear louder and louder as the party boat came in to the point where we had to cease production like for long periods of time just because we had to wait for this copyrighted music to move along. It, it sucked at first, but then it became sort of an ongoing joke. Like, all right, here it comes. All right, scene, uh, whatever, whatever, A, take one. And then we went and tried to do it before the thing came back. When we shot the the, kid, the major kiss scene in, um, in, in Point Pleasant Park, uh, it wasn't the party boat, at least I don't think, but another boat came by blaring music while we were doing that. It, we thought the party boat was following us, like a horror film. It was just like stalking us. It's definitely not home. It's no place to have all your friends together in one spot. <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I heard boom, boom. That night presented a lot of problems, <laughs> just uncontrollable problems and just guerrilla filmmaking at its finest. But uh, in the end, we got what we needed, and I thought it was a really good introduction to Ellie back into Nolan's life, a reintroduction. So after Ellie's back in Nolan's life, we have a sequence where I'm sort of consider it the Something's got to go wrong because I'm feeling way too damn good. The introduction of Sam, our main antagonist, our physical manifestation of depression, played by Bob Mann. In the original script, the idea was that Nolan was going to go for a little kayak ride and he ends up on a beach and then on the beach, suddenly Sam shows up and then they have a conversation. I think it played out in a pretty similar fashion, but once we switched the location to the city, uh, we decided that it was going to be a coffee shop where no one was going to go to a coffee shop and then out of nowhere this character was going to introduce himself and we would think that it's just a normal person but then it ends up being his depression in a manifested form. Unfortunately we couldn't find a coffee shop that was going to work out but thankfully Bob knew the owner of Sweet Hereafter Cheesecakery uh, on Quimpool Road here in Halifax and 
uh, he let us come in and film the scene, which worked out beautifully. In this scene, we see Nolan sort of returning to something that he used to love, which was um, drawing and, and, and just, you know, making art. Clearly, Ellie has already had a, uh, a massive influence on his on his life and his mindset, um, and he now wants to sort of get back to things that used to make him happy and things that he's been neglecting for a while. In comes Sam <laughs> to ruin it all. The very first take of this, we had Sam sit directly uh, in front of him, sort of at the same table. I actually cut that shot short uh, and cut early before we finished it because I was just looking at it and I thought, this doesn't look right. Like something about this is off. So, why not? Sorry. So then we changed it up to have Sam sitting behind Nolan in another seat and then he sort of comes in with a little bit of uh, theatrics and then we're introduced to him. And for the entirety of the scene, except right at the end, he's out of focus. For, for this introduction to this character, I, I wanted to do something creepy and, and something off-putting about never being able to quite see this character. You know, he's always, half his face is completely dark and he's completely out of focus and it just, uh, I felt like it added to the creep factor. But in this scene, we get the full introduction to Sam as he immediately begins to poke holes in the happiness that Nolan has. I'm currently taking bets on how long it will be before you just stop talking to her again. And Bob brings such a balance of friendly and funny with complete venomous spite. And it, and it just works so well. Um, you see Nolan try and fight back, but then he sort of immediately turned around again where it's like, oh, maybe he's right. You know what? No, no, you're not right. This one's going to be different. How about you cut the shit with the girl and stop toying with her heart. I'm not gonna do that. No, fine. And the entire time Sam knows that, ah, I'm gonna get you. You, you think you have control, but you absolutely don't. Obviously, it's, it's depression versus the person who's depressed, but within this scene, it's, it's guy versus guy. It's human versus human. Sam's one goal is complete control. And uh, basically all he wants is Nolan and all he wants is to wreck his life. I really wish I could just shut you up because this time you're actually wrong. The combat, Sam showing up in, in Nolan's life, um, he shoots a message to, to Ellie and then they go for a drive where they're, they're talking about the past and Ellie decides that, hey, let's get to know what's happened in the, the time that we haven't seen each other. What is grown up Nolan like? Uh, I really don't know. And I think it's the first time that he's actually thought about it and realized that he doesn't know because he's, he's sort of submitted to this idea that depression controls his life and he is completely submitted to the idea that um, he has lost himself within this darkness. He has no idea who he is anymore. He doesn't know who Nolan is. I mean, he used to have interests and stuff like that, but it, they've all sort of dissipated because of depression's hold on him. And then a little later on, they're doing the uh, typical let's go on a date, I guess, thing. Honestly, I feel like this may have been a, a leftover from the original uh, idea when we were filming on a lakefront at a camp. And they're skipping rocks, which is just a bit silly. But then eventually Nolan sort of walks away, but then Ellie sees it and asks him, hey, what's going on? And when Nolan won't answer, she just continues the conversation, talks about the old days. And Nolan isn't hearing a single word of it for a few reasons. One, he is very much caught up with just what's happening. You know, for, for brief moments and flashes, he's happy because he's missed her. Um, even though he didn't want to admit it out loud, he has missed her greatly. But also it's that struggle between Sam and Nolan's thoughts. And then, you know, the big moment happens where they kiss. These two characters who were separated by time and, and, and Nolan's own struggles, the feelings never went away. Uh, I think there were feelings when they were younger and, and that lasted a very long time and I, and I genuinely think that these two were the love of each other's lives, separated by a, an extremely sad circumstance of Nolan's unfortunate fight. I have missed you so much. But it's a risk. 
uh, which is another huge theme of this film. It's a risk. Nolan is taking a risk by doing this um, because it could absolutely backfire and then he's back to where he started. Sam was right. He's an idiot. He shouldn't have done it, but that's not the case and it works out. And then we're on the lakefront for quite a decent section of this film. This is sort of Nolan trying very hard to get back on track and it's, it's, it's very colorful uh, on purpose. You know, so far in the film, we've seen a lot of moments where it's either been grayed out or there hasn't been much color at all. But now we're sort of back into it and it's colorful greens, colorful blues and all that. It's, it's funny because when we got there, uh, somebody we know and an actor that we've worked with uh, allowed us to use the spot, which was uh, his property. Um, but when we got there, because it's a lake, and believe it or not, lakes have ducks, uh, there was duck shit everywhere. <laughs> And we mopped the duck shit off of the, the uh, wharf here. So that was the start to our day. Mopping duck shit. So to begin the scene, we have uh, the two characters walking down and then uh, eventually Ellie very playfully kicks Nolan into the water. <laughs> and that sort of playful nature of, of what, you know, would have been their childhood and, and, and years of being friends sort of really comes back and, and I think they both realized like at that time um, that eh, this, this, is, this is wonderful. Um, no one has a moment alone where he just sort of thinks to himself like we're back um, and now it's sort of taken that next level because they have started a relationship so it's, it's, it's sort of even more incredible to him uh, and her um, in, in a lot of ways. But that turns sour fairly fast when, uh, when Sam comes back. Hot. Damn! <sighs> so now that he's given Nolan a chance to figure it out on his own, now he has to step in and, and be a little bit more specific. And in this scene, Sam is just an, an asshole. <laughs> I honestly cannot imagine a scenario where you say something that I want to hear. No, interesting thoughts aren't really your thing, so... And I think Sam represents a lot of uh, a, a lot of Nolan's fears and insecurities, and I think he he represents a lot of um, the struggle that Nolan is is sort of having. But I also, on the other hand, I think that Sam has his own mindset that is separate from Nolan's own consciousness. But he also takes it too far all the time because he knows that uh, oh, I know I know how to get under his skin. This this will work. Watch everybody sit back and watch this. I'm about to mess this kid's uh, whole day up. So I'm looking at this girl of yours, right? And I'm just thinking, she is one fine piece of ass. Enough! <laughs> All right, okay, okay. I'm sorry. That was a bit crass. Which pushes it past that line of being okay. I mean, it's very clear, especially in this, that Sam is a, is a dick. It's also an example in this scene, just the charisma that Bob has. You know, he, he says some of these lines in a way where out of context, you're like, oh, that's, that's funny. <laughs> this, guy, this guy's quick. He's a little sarcastic, but he's quick. But then when you really think about it and you, and you break it down to, wait a minute. No, actually, this guy's an asshole. Um, this scene's a prime example of that because he's just taking the sword and he's just nudging it further and further and further into Nolan. Um, with some just incredibly crass dialogue, but because he wants to regain that control, because he wants to make uh, Nolan question everything, and really playing on the things that uh, that hurt Nolan in this, just because he's like, all right, well, you had your fun, time to get back to work, knock this off, you suck, come back to me. And it almost works, almost. She could get any guy she wants, any guy in the world. And I'm just wondering, what is she doing hanging around with you? Another aspect too that you see in this is, is Sam's use of um, friendly terminology. Throughout the film, he'll call Nolan like, I, I'm your friend, I'm in your corner. Uh, in this scene, he calls him pal. He uses these terms to sort of get into Nolan's head and be like, yeah, you know, when you think of me, think of pal, think of buddy, think of friend. And there's a couple of moments in this where um, you sort of see Nolan fight back and, and he's, he's, he's more open with Ellie. He's sort of uh, drowning um, um, Sam out and, and you notice that Sam's sort of starting to lose control a little bit and he doesn't like it. I'm sure she'll really appreciate the added stress. I guess just stress and you might have been wrong about me dealing with a lot of different things. 
My least favorite moment of the film is actually in this, uh, in this section. So, let's talk about Jake, AKA Ellie's ex-boyfriend. So originally, uh, I wanted to have an actor play this role. Due to some scheduling conflicts, we couldn't get the actor in, and because of the low budget nature of the film and, and the time, uh, the specific time we had to make this movie, I had to, unfortunately, step in and play Jake, who has a hell of a farmer's tan in this. It's seeing myself in this film, I hate it. <laughs> I really hate it. I, I never I never want to be on camera in an acting role and for whatever reason I, I always end up um, just because of circumstances being a part of, of the projects I, I direct. Uh, I was I was Jake douchey ex-boyfriend in this in lay on a web series that we made. I played the uh, the douchebag director. You may be seeing a theme here. I don't know what hole in the wall film school you came from but if this plant is not 37 degrees to that light, we are going to lose the entire integrity of what I've been working on for years. So please start using your brain on this, okay? Use the creative side, cool? Get out of here. And in a film I directed called The Last Divide for uh, Winterlight Productions, I played uh, a, a lunatic in the woods trying to break into a cabin who eventually gets shot in the back. So. I guess um, for whatever reason life is trying to tell me that I should play assholes in film um, despite my reluctance to even want to be on the other side of the camera ever. So I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> I, I don't think Nolan had anything to worry about with Jake because Jake just looks like a piece of work that should probably just go away, find a hobby and leave everybody alone. <laughs> There's a leaf in your face. There you're good. So during the, the, this sort of lakefront segment, especially after Sam sort of grills, uh, grills Nolan, um, you see Nolan start to get quite anxious. And, and, and it was a major point of the scene is to show the anxiety. Um, we had shown sort of the darkness and, and there were a couple of anxious moments leading to this. For, for the most part, it was just more or less the depression side of, of what Nolan was dealing with. And we hadn't really gotten full tilt to the anxiety. Well, this scene, we changed that. But the way that it, it sort of works for Nolan when he's dealing with anxiety and depression is just like every sort of major idea that uh, that will make him feel smaller or make him worry or anything, you know, even when it's just a silly concept like um, the, the comments they, they talk about, you know, college and the, the alley went to college and it was this big naked party and stuff like that. Like it's just foolishness. Uh, There's nothing to worry about. But because Nolan is always having this little nagging um, 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 thing in his ear, that being Sam, it, it, all of it seems realistic at the time and it sort of builds up over time where like if you take each layer, it's sort of this silly, ridiculous idea that, you know, Sam's putting in his head. But when you put that all together and it's just sort of this big mountain falls onto Nolan, he can't control it. He's just, he's anxious. He believes every word that is being fed into his head and he just gets really, really small and he feels really insecure about everything that's going on. I'm insane. But the, the line when he says, I'm insane, when he, when he comes out of, out of his anxiety attack, um, I think a lot of the times, especially for me, it, 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 you sort of feel crazy. You feel like, you know, what am I doing? What, why, did I, why did that just happen? What just caused that? And then you start to look at it and you sort of pick it apart and say, there's no reason that just happened. This is silly. In the end, it's, it's really not, it, it's not your fault. It's not that you're crazy. It's not that you're weak. It's just, it's this thing that you're dealing with. It's this mental illness that you're dealing with that is very hard to control and it's very hard to, uh, to understand when it's left completely alone. Um, which for Nolan it is. I think, I think it's an important moment because it shows you where Nolan is and what he thinks of himself dealing with this. Um, he thinks he's insane. He thinks it's a problem and he thinks something's severely wrong with him. And he, I think he feels like it's his fault for overthinking when in the end it's just a mixture of all uncontrollable things that are happening within his mind and it's, uh, it, it's very hard to combat. When Ellie comes back down after talking to Jake, you see a, a, a very... Um, you know, black and white visual of what Nolan is, is presenting as himself. I'll be back later though, okay? 
he's very calm he seems happy he seems like nothing's wrong but then when you get the flip side of that and you see his face um, even in the beginning of that scene and then in the end like he's he's struggling something is attacking his mind and he just can't handle it but then when he turns around he's got a smile so that mask is always there um, even to a point where you know if you hit a certain degree turning to look at somebody it's back on and then you back with yourself you take it off and it's like oh okay and back on sad depressed like i can't handle this this sucks no problem i'll see you later back to it and that's sort of what's happening with nolan here ellie's sort of seeing through the mask and i, and I think the mask is cracking quite a bit at this point and, and throughout the film ellie sees that hey there's something wrong with him and, and and um he's hurting i don't know what to do right now and i don't know how to react to what he's what he's going through but something is wrong and something is hurting him and, and i'm going to do my best to try and comfort him as well as uh you know, uh, this day turned weird. I didn't expect it. So let, let's make up for it. And let's go do something else later on, which leads to the dinner scene between Ellie and Nolan. At least they thought it would only be Ellie and Nolan. Can you pass the pepper? Here you go, sweetheart. Is it just me or is she looking a little flushed tonight? The dinner scene is one of my favorite moments because it's it's sort of the first time that we get a look at at Sam truly losing grip of uh, of Nolan. So the whole scene is very simple. You know, you just have Nolan and Ellie having a dinner. Eventually, Sam pops up and then basically taking control, or at least trying to, uh, of the the dinner. Sam is trying his hardest to mock Nolan, especially when Nolan starts to open up and admit how much he does care for Ellie. I'm in love with you. <laughs> oh, pal. You have no idea how this is supposed to go, do you? <laughs> I suppose you've got a ring in your pocket, too. But, of course, Ellie returns the, the, the feelings. They're mutual. Uh, and this is where Sam loses it. You know, Sam, lo he, he loses control of the situation that he had very firmly grasped for, for so long. But he's losing it because... Whatever's going on between these two is allowing Nolan a little bit of comfort. You know, the risk paid off despite Sam saying, oh, there's a stupid risk, don't do it. It's paying off. It's starting to affect Sam and he sees that, uh-oh, losing the fight here. Time to do something drastic. There's a couple different ways to shoot this. Um, but I think I think sometimes you, you think that you need to, to, to overreach with, with how you film something. And I think when you do that, there's a good chance that you could lose the story. Because you're, you're sort of overdoing it, you're doing all these fancy camera angles, you're doing all this fancy lighting, and, and it's just sort of like, well, we lost the story because we have so much going on visually or, 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 or audibly that it's just like everything got lost. But for this scene, it's, it's a simple scene. It's three people having a dinner, one doesn't exist to the other, but it's just a very simple way to, to capture it. And I think it, it just, it, it does the scene service because it doesn't distract from the core point of the scene. Why am I the only one not eating? This isn't fair. I'm glad you came back. And every action has a reaction, so Sam now has to retaliate in a major way. And he does. Smash cut to a very intense dream sequence where Sam's basically pulling overtime. You know, he's going in there, he's attacking Nolan at every point. He's questioning his decisions. He's saying, hey, why would you take a risk? You know, there's a scene where we shot uh, Nolan and, and Sam in the car. They're driving, Nolan's driving which the car was never moving. Basically had the van parked and then we had a light going by as I was sort of turning it on a, on a C-stand as if, you know, they were passing by uh, streetlights. But Sam is really just diving deep and, and showing you like, hey man, what are you doing? Oh, <laughs> oh we got a little risk taker here. <laughs> Veering off that familiar path he knows so well. But he really starts attacking this risk-taking nature of Nolan and, and just really going for the throat. But it's time to come back to reality, and reality is me. I'm your reality. You see what happens when you take a risk? Take the big leap, and you drown. And Sam is not done yet. Uh, Sam is just getting started. This kitchen fight is... Probably one of my favorite scenes in the film. Bob and Taylor brought 
the film to just another level with this scene. No one so far has been sort of on the losing side of uh, any control with a discussion with Sam, but in this he sort of gains a little bit of, not necessarily control, but I'm speaking now, shut up, uh, at least for a little bit, and explaining himself in a very specific way. And Taylor brought the intensity that, that really sold me on, on having him play Nolan in the first place. Uh, if I remember correctly, this was one of the scenes that we auditioned with, and I remember Taylor just nailing it, that intensity, that very, very vicious intensity, because Nolan's had enough. You know, he, he's been anxious, he's happy. He, he, he has one thing that makes him happy in his life, and all Sam wants to do is screw it up. It's like you get a nice, sick pleasure out of seeing me sweat, shake with anxiety, and not even be able to have one fucking night of happiness. That is untrue. I am just trying to help you understand- UNDERSTAND?! <laughs> what in the hell am I supposed to understand from you? That I should sit in my room for the rest of my life and stare at the fucking walls?! And Sam doesn't stop his sarcasm, you know? He doesn't turn to anything else. He's just rooted in this sarcastic, uh, dickish manner that he brings out in full force. Now the thing that's different with Sam in this is that he actually plays silent for a lot of it. He lets Nolan get it out of his system. I can see you're having a bad day. Oh, for fuck's sake! It, it's just that perfect venomous bite that Sam has and, and everything that he does to Nolan. Nolan's admission here is telling in a major way of what Nolan's going through and what Nolan wants. If there was sort of like one line to describe the whole film and to describe the whole purpose of the film, it's when he says, I want to feel heartbreak with a slight chance of happiness. Which is far better than the alternative of feeling nothing. Not being able to, to cry or smile or anything because you literally feel nothing. Nolan's entire plea here, his entire just speech, everything he wants is explained within that sentence because he's tired of feeling nothing. He's tired of being in this mental limbo of, oh my God, everything I do, I just feel nothing. I can't feel happy, I can't feel sad. For whatever reason, my, my brain in this depression thing is telling me, hey, the hell are you doing? Get back here, just stop doing that. Just sit down, what are you trying to do? Which is just numb. It's how no one feels, he feels numb. But this idea that, hey man, I could get my heart broken. I could be sad as hell tomorrow. She could snap my heart into 18 pieces and ruin me. But I'd feel something. I would feel the heartache. I would feel pain. And I could live with that. Because there's also a chance at happiness. But above all else, heartbreak or happiness, I feel something. That's huge for Nolan, because now he's truly, truly coming to terms with what's happening, what he wants, and he's presenting the struggles with not knowing what to do to get out of this because it's controlling his life. One of the, one of the big turning points here too is that Nolan says the line, I wanna have what I had before you came back. And this is where we really see an evil side of, of Sam, where he says, you know, See, that's where I think you might have your wires just a little bit crossed. Where's this fantasy past of yours where I wasn't there? Which absolutely turns any sort of progress that Nolan had in terms of fighting this and saying, I want to feel pain, let me do this, get the hell out of my life, I'm going to find whatever it is I need to find to be better and to feel like I did before you were here. Unfortunately, Sam's been here the whole time, and you're deluded. I've been with you a long, long time. You think I just popped up one day? Out of nowhere, saw you, and thought, oh, he'd be fun. No. No. Whether it's true or not, no one doesn't know but he believes it because of how serious Sam is being. And then he begins to doubt himself because that's Sam's biggest talent 
is making Nolan doubt himself. He builds on those insecurities and he makes Nolan doubt everything he's doing. And, he, and Nolan mentions this, you know, overthinking things like, hey, is, is this girl I really love cheating on me? Am I bad or am I a burden or everything, you know, mixed within the film itself. Sam's perfect at that. He's perfect at getting under the skin of Nolan. And in this scene, you see that come to a head. You know, you think Nolan is maybe starting to gain some traction here. He's starting to gain some control. He's, he's starting to fight back and, you know, tell this thing, hey, fuck you. No, I want this. I'm tired of you. I'm going to get back to how it was. And Sam flips it again and he regains control. So much so that it causes Nolan to throw a glass, which, you know, Ellie hears who's sleeping upstairs and, and she comes down. Uh, and then the sort of, the downfall of Nolan continues. The Sam sponsored <laughs> downfall of Nolan continues. When, when Ellie comes down and Nolan's just sort of having this moment, he's on the verge of tears, like he's about to collapse into himself. He tells Ellie to fuck off and he doesn't mean it. None of it's words that he means at all. He's just so caught up with this absolute um, destructive force that is Sam, uh, ruining him and burying him and just turning him into this heap of an of a emotional mess. Um, and because of that, you know, everything that Nolan's saying is towards Sam, but unfortunately it comes out towards Ellie and none of it is genuine. Can you please just fuck off? What? I said, fuck off! And he immediately notices that because he's like, shit, he got me again. I cannot believe I did this. And outside, you know, that fight continues where you know, Nolan is, is, is trying to explain in, the, in a way what is going on, but he, he can't take it that one step. You know, earlier in the film, he says, um, you know, it wasn't your fault. Uh, about not talking for a while um, and he's nearing that point where he can jump over that hurdle and say hey I promise you it isn't your fault I'm dealing with this thing but he can't quite get there and it's the same with this scene as, as soon as they start talking you know Sam's coming down the stairs and, and he's mocking him again what the hell was that I woke up in a pissy mood and, and I, did, I didn't mean to say that to you well, who exactly were you saying it to you uh, tell her it was me I'm sorry mocking no one's own sanity really, uh, uh, with this entire thing, and, and Nolan has a real trouble. He's, th he's almost there, you know, he's inching towards this idea of admitting that, hey, I'm hurting, it's hurting me so bad that I'm, I'm hurting the people I love, I'm sorry, but he just can't get there, because Sam still has that control, uh, and Nolan hasn't broken that yet. Come on, tell her you're arguing with the strange but handsome man who follows you around everywhere, huh? It's okay, just, just tell me. Nolan, I'm your friend, introduce me to your girl. I don't know! Okay, I just don't fucking know. And it leads into a, a very, very, a very dark moment in, in Nolan's life. And then we hit the section of um, just pure irrational thinking coming from Nolan. He, he's, he's going somewhere. He doesn't know where. And quite frankly, he doesn't really give a shit. But he's going somewhere and he needs to get away from Sam, whether he's driving. 100 miles east or two meters out of the yard. He just needs to get away from Sam in some fashion. So he ends up, you know, going for a walk in the woods and then that leads to a very, very intense moment. Um, but before we get there, you, you see that Sam is, is not giving up. Despite the fact that Sam has basically just ruined a, a relationship, it's not enough for him. You know, he still doesn't feel like he has the full control he, he should have on, on Nolan. But he just keeps showing up no matter what corner Nolan turns in the woods. He's just trying to get away from him. <laughs> Remember that time you told her to fuck off? <laughs> I mean, we could laugh about that now, right? No, we can't. Okay. <laughs> um, which leads to uh, the one take scene where uh, Nolan is trying to understand what's going on. Um, he, he's trying to get away from, from, uh, from Sam and Sam is just popping up in, in different areas. Like no one cannot find him. He understands like he's right there. Oh my God, will you stop? And then he's gone. It's like, oh, uh, and then he hears a voice. He finds him down here. Oh my God, he's gone. Looks around, he's gone again. And then he's behind him. The original plan was that we were going to film that in a way where like we were moving around. There's a bunch of camera angles and stuff. And we were just going to get this whole thing in like, you know, eight different angles and, and cut it all together. Thankfully, we had a steady cam uh, during the filming of this, 
So on the day we decided, why don't we try something that's a one take? Can we do this in a way where uh, he's zip, zipping around and it's, you know, it's interesting and like he's, he's sort of like here and then he's not, but can we do it in one shot? Is it possible? So I think we were trying to get away with movie magic by sort of hiding it behind the cuts where a bunch of angles would sort of hide that we're moving him around and all this sort of magic is happening. And in the final edit, obviously, it's it's fairly seamless. And you can't really tell um, that there's anything off about it. But if you hear the raw footage, uh, all you hear is this scuffling of feet on, on dirt and rock as, as we're all trying to get in the place at the right time. You are clearly going to need someone to help you through this very difficult time you're obviously having. Look, just don't yell at me again, okay? It's just not a good way to treat your friends. The next scene after this, uh, Nolan is, is continuing to try and get away from him. And you start to see him become very emotional and sad, uh, almost at the verge of tears. Um, the original plan for this was that uh, Sam was gonna continue his sort of tirade and say like, you know, you can try and get away from me, but guess what? And then he's gonna end up popping up in front of Nolan. Right in front of you but it, it didn't quite work with the way that the next scene played out, but this one worked a lot better, especially how the big moment coming up um, turned out. Yeah, see, I don't know what makes you think going deeper into the woods is gonna make any kind of difference. So the next scene is one that kind of did a 180 on the day, but it made the film so much better and it made the scene so much better. The original intent of this scene, which is uh, Nolan on the verge of suicide, was supposed to play out where Sam was gonna sort of push him towards it, sort of mocking him like, oh, you're not gonna do it. Well, come on then, we're waiting. Like, come on, the bus is coming. Let's let's wrap this up and get it over with. But on the day, uh, Bob and Taylor came up to me and said, uh, I don't think this will work with the way that the story is, is going. And I don't think it'll work with the way that Sam's character specifically is sort of arcing in the story. They had basically suggested, can we have, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes to go away, sort of come up with something um, that's still in the same vein what the scene is, but uh, is sort of different in terms of execution. And I said yes, because for me, there are there are certain aspects of, of a story, especially when you're writing and directing, that you know you, you sort of fall in love with and, and you want to keep because there is an overarching vision for a director. You know, there, there's a thing you want um, to achieve and, and it's something that you thought about for a long time and, and you want to make sure that it's it's the vision that you um, had planned for this story to, to sort of follow. But I genuinely, for me, and every director is different, but I genuinely, for me, believe that the collaboration aspect between director and, and actors is hugely important. Because if I don't trust them, we have a problem. I need to trust these actors with my life uh, in the same way that I hope they trust me with, you know, taking care of them and, and making sure that they have the environment um, and, and, and trust and, and love of the art to, to make sure that what they're doing is, is um, respected. And I am very much one to take in suggestions because I think that it's very rarely, I've never seen it actually happen in this way, but it's just very rarely a case where somebody's coming in and doing it for their own good. You know, doing it selfishly where, you know, oh, I'm an actor and I'm a character. I'd rather do this because, you know, I, I, I think it's better for me. I've been lucky, I guess. I don't know. It's never happened to me. Um, and this was a case of, you know, it not being that and continuing not to be that. Uh, Bob and Taylor specifically Bob with the way that this was going to change for Sam. And Bob felt that the overarching story of the character um, it was working except for this one spot. And it was sort of a sore spot. And, and in hindsight, looking back, I, I understand where he's coming from. I'm glad he brought it up. You know, Sam finds Nolan uh, on the verge of taking his own life. That all sort of remained, but the way that Sam came about it changed 
drastically um, instead of pushing him and being like, all right, come on, do it. Been here before, come on, go ahead, do it. In sort of a challenging manner, it changed from that to a sort of desperate friend um, coming up to Nolan and saying, Well, we've certainly been here before, haven't we? It was a complete twist from the sort of violent nature that, that Sam was, was uh, portraying in the past couple of scenes, trying to regain control. And it was just sort of this, uh, you know, we've had our fight and now, now come in for the hug. Like, it's, 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 it's fine. Despite, you know, the intentions still being very vile and, and against Nolan's well-being. But it completely 180 from the sort of challenge to do it to, come on, we're not going to do this. We're, we're, we're pals. I'm in your corner. Let's not go down this road. And it worked a million times better than what I wrote. What I wrote just simply didn't work. Um, I thought it did at the time, I genuinely did, but, but looking back at it and seeing what, what Bob brought to that scene and, and how they changed it, I almost made the wrong decision. Uh, and I'm glad Bob and Taylor suggested, hey, can we have a chance to change this? Um, because not only did it change the, the scene's dynamic in terms of the story, but it changed the way that I was gonna film it because my original intention was sort of all these angles and it was going to be an intense sort of fast paced scene but uh, basically what happened was they when they came back and they had something ready to go that they wanted to show me with the scene, with the scene changes uh, I said all right let's let's see what you have and, and I'll stand over here and I'll watch and, and we'll see if maybe I want to change something or if, if I like it or maybe even if we want to go back to the original tent because I don't know I, I didn't know what they were going to do they then performed and I watched sort of leaning down on this rock and just watching sort of in, in silence from one angle. I just stayed there and I watched the whole scene. And I realized that if we had taken this in a way that I, I planned, which was fast paced, lots of angles and all that, it would have absolutely done a disservice to the stillness that, that worked so well um, with what they were doing. You know, this was an intense moment, but it wasn't about sort of fast paced moving or, or thriller aspects to the, to the thing. It's not a thrilling scene. It's a very sad scene. It's a very personal scene. It's, there's a there's a character who thinks that he cannot escape this hell to the point where he is considering taking his own life. And when I watched them play it out for the first time, this new version of the scene, um, I just realized that you know, let's put a camera here, let's film this, let's be as still as possible, and let's let the intensity be what the characters are doing on screen and let's not do this in a crazy hectic manner and it just it worked on every level and i owe that all to bob and taylor because they were willing to ask and they were willing to put in that extra work to fix something that they felt could be better and to change something that they felt would better the overall story not just that scene and not their personal acting and, and not something for their demo reel later but something that they felt would work better for the entirety of, the, of the, the film. And it did. You know, you marry that to Donnie, Donnie Wall's music and it's just this perfect marriage of incredible emotion uh, and, and just insanely important and, and, and desperate and sad and, and every emotion that I can even think of. Um, it's just a big moment for them. Uh, it, it just worked out so much better. My fight has been taken from me. This is my last chance. The scene itself, I mean, this scene is a very low moment, obviously. Um, the location that we used, it was actually a location that um, we filmed at. I was a production assistant on another film uh, and, and they had found the spot and they filmed it. And I, I always loved the look of it because sort of have all this bush in the background, but in front, which you see in the ending of the scene, you have all these dead trees. And I thought that it was it was a good sort of visual metaphor for what Noel was going through. Um, he found something beautiful, and for a little while his life sort of looked a little bit more colorful than it did before. And now he's sort of back into this place of, of just pure depression and, and, and near suicide. And now what's in front of him is just a dead forest. The scene itself had a lot of aspects that um, were spontaneous obviously with what I said but one of the key things was in the scene itself Nolan once he throws the knife away and, and he sort of ex uh, sort of accepts like the fate that this isn't gonna happen 
he recites something that he very clearly has read a lot, has possibly written down a lot, something he's become very familiar with over the years, and that is his suicide note. And what he recites when he talks about his grandmother, um, when he talks about he has no fight left anymore, uh, how he apologizes for what he's about to do, um, that is all a note that he has thought about so much that he has written down so many times that he can recite it from memory, word for word. Please forgive me for what I'm about to say. I don't want to live anymore. My life is a deep hole and the, the harder I try to dig myself out, the deeper and deeper I get. Taylor actually wrote that. Um, we talked very early on I, and I suggested the idea that, hey, what if you, as Nolan, came up with this? Now, this is a very dark moment. It's a very serious moment, but just the, the pure honesty and the genuine nature, um, it, it was all Taylor. Taylor's one of the most talented human beings I've ever met. He's one of the most passionate human beings I've ever met, and he's just full of empathy and, and love, and he's able to create stuff like this that is so important that is so meaningful and that is, is, is so tied into not only the character, but this idea of, of depression and, and this idea of suicide. Taylor cared very much about what we were presenting and it shows in this moment where he wrote this thing that is much better than anything I could have written uh, and, and really shows just the struggle in the most intense form of what Nolan is going through. Please forgive me. I love you. Goodbye. One of the one of the sharpest lines I think in the film, um, and sharp meaning just like a knife. In the end, when Sam says, "That's that's nice. It's very poetic." You should write it down. A full-blown mockery of, you know, Nolan's thoughts and his suicide note. Because Sam knows what this is. Sam absolutely knows what Nolan is reciting. And to just stick it in him one more time because he can't help himself, he has to make a comment like that. Uh, and it's just such a, such a poisonous line. And it sort of shows that despite Sam playing friendly um, for this brief moment, uh, he's still the piece of garbage that we've seen throughout the film. It, it never would have happened and it never would have been as good if we went based off of what I wrote. And, and I'm okay admitting that. Um, it was a humbling experience because it allowed me to really understand how important that collaboration is and how important that trust is between you know, filmmaker and actor. I think we would have lost the third act of this film uh, in a major way if the talents of Taylor and, and Bob, you know, uh, weren't there to fix this uh, and change it. And if the care wasn't there to make this uh, simply a better film, a better scene, and a better moment um, within the entirety of the story. And I, and I owe so much to them for that. Once Nolan returns to the house, we have a, a very crucial moment between him and uh, Bill. So the grandfather's there cleaning up the glass and he's just sort of asking, hey, what happened here? And Nolan has to put on that mask again. Um, and he thinks that, you know, once he says, I'm gonna go take a nap because I'm tired, that's the end of it. But Bill wants to know what's happening. I'm gonna go take a nap. Why is that? I'm just tired. Nolan. Hold on, what's wrong with you? And then we get a very, very big moment. Uh, and I think a very crucial moment for the point of view of, uh, of Bill when he says, Look, you're an intelligent guy. Snap out of it. I, I think that there is a, a lot of misconceptions um, about depression and, and mental illness where, you know, some people believe that, hey, that guy's too smart to be depressed, or that guy's got too much going on to be depressed. He's got too much in his life that's working to be depressed, and it's just not the case. 
You know, there are so many other variables of this thing that you just can't control. And I mean, you could have the best day of your life and still have this thing attack you in such a severe way. And that gets under Nolan's skin. And you see the look he gives his grandfather before walking upstairs is a very intense look because when Bill says snap out of it, Nolan says without saying a word, he says to, to Bill, you don't, you don't understand what you're talking about. You don't understand what I'm what I'm feeling. I'm not gonna snap out of this. I've been trying for years. I can't just snap out of this. What are you talking about? And I don't think the the meanness of that look is necessarily directed towards Bill as a person. I think it's more directed to the idea of that you know, no one can snap out of this, which he obviously can't. Um, it hasn't worked. It's not going to work to just say, oh, fixed. I'm all done. And it's, it's a bit of a play on this idea uh, uh, of some misconceptions of, about what this is and, and how it works. And, you know, this idea that, uh, oh, you'll get out of it. You know, go, go get some fresh air, go for a walk, go hang out with friends. It'll, 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 you'll get out of it. You're just in a funk, which is just not the case. Um, this is a very serious thing and it's a very hard thing. And it's, it's not just this thing that's a phase for some people, you know? And it's why no one gives the look that he does. And it's why the follow up to this is, you know, the plea from, from Bill saying, Seriously, Nolan, what's wrong with you? You don't have to be afraid to tell me. I don't like seeing you staying in this house alone all the time. It'd be good for you to get out. No one just wants him out of there, not because he doesn't want to see him, just because this is hurting me and it's going to hurt you. And before it does, please leave. You know, don't talk to me anymore. Um, and, and Nolan gets a little bit sassy with uh, with Bill and, and Bill sort of, you know, as a little bit of an authority figure says, Nolan, I won't have you doing this. Look, I've been supportive and understanding this entire time. But I will not have you speak to me like that. Do you understand? Yet in his voice, you hear that sadness. You know, it's not like you don't talk to me like that. It's it's sadder than that. It, it's broken hearted. Um, and which, you know, the scene ends with Nolan saying, Don't speak to me. It's as simple as that. A sentence that is not a literal sentence. It's not a sentence that he means directly as it's, you know, described. It's a sentence that means, leave me alone because all I'm going to do is make your life worse. All I'm going to do is be a burden on you and everything about me is going to hurt you. So please just get out because I don't want to hurt you anymore. It's just a real sad moment of uh, the feelings that you can have when you're deep into this, where you think that no matter what you do, your actions are going to be a burden on somebody else. You're going to hurt somebody else because of the hurt that you have and you not being able to control that hurt that you have, you think that everything that you do is going to be a burden on other people, it's going to hurt other people, and the best solution is to be alone so that you don't have the chance to hurt anybody else. And it's an incredibly heartbreaking thing. The further away he is from you, the less pain he'll feel. This is better for him, trust me. So once this big blowout happens, you know, between Sam and Nolan, Nolan and Nellie, Nolan and Bill, and sort of everybody leaves his life, it is like we sort of reset the film and we reset the story. Uh, Nolan's back to this uh, daily life of sleeping, getting up, sitting on the couch, watching TV, doing absolutely nothing, and then back to bed, and then, you know, rinse and repeat. And it shows that, you know, for a brief, brief moment, Sam won. Sam regained control of Nolan's life. Uh, and it shows within this monotonous redundancy that Nolan's life becomes and it's breaking Nolan down and, and Sam just keeps driving the spike in. They're watching TV at night and, and Nolan gets a text from what we assume is Ellie. Wink, wink, it is Ellie. And then Sam sort of enters the scene and, and reminds him, so who's that? Are we doing this again? I didn't think so. As Nolan, you know, throws down the phone. And this all leads to sort of our most calm dream sequence of the whole film, which, which Nolan, you know, for the first time we see him, you know, fall asleep. He has this dream, which is much more calm, much more smooth. You know, it, it is upsetting and it's, it's sort of unsettling, but in the end, it's, it's very much sort of opening his eyes to something about Ellie, you know, something about their past.
and he wakes up naturally. He doesn't wake up in a panic. He doesn't wake up in the sort of like uh, this fever dream state where he's just, uh, what was that? Oh my God, that was like a horror movie. It was a slow eye open and he realizes something about what he just saw. Maybe the key to all this, which leads him to the woods. The very first scene we shot for the film, which is him returning to the spot where they used to play and, uh, and confronting this thing and trying to understand, okay, you used to be happy here. What happened? What is going on? And then of course, Sam never failing shows up again, but this time it's a little different because you start to see the impatience that Nolan has. He's, he's on the verge of figuring out what it is. It's reminding him that, you know, there is somebody there who wants to listen and that being Ellie. Um, and this all leads to the big moment, the big final confrontation. Too bad you missed the sunrise. It's beautiful this time of year. The original plan was we were going to film this uh, back on the lakefront. I think the original script called for that. For whatever reason, I didn't feel it was right. I, I didn't want to return to that lakefront. I thought that um, the whole thing wouldn't quite work with what we were, we were sort of trying to achieve here. And it just seemed like a location that had nothing to do with the story. So what we decided to do was we went to Citadel Hill in Halifax, which is a big open spanning field. And we filmed it there. And what I love about that is that it is a complete contrast to what Nolan's normalcy looks like. You know, Nolan is always sort of in his house and he's always dealing with this thing where he, uh, he has this, as I've mentioned so much, this redundancy of life where he's stuck in a house. He feels, I think, a little bit safe in that, where he is in a place that he knows he's, he's got walls surrounding him and he feels like, okay, I'm not exposed, I'm not vulnerable. Um, yes, Sam is here, but at least I know he's here type of thing where this big open field, I mean, there's no way for him to run anymore. He can't run away. It's a big, big open field. He's exposed, he's vulnerable. He's completely open to everything in the world, which is what he, he needs to, to really look at this and, and admit, hey, I'm hurting, you know, this is why. Bob is amazing in this because he really goes full-blown vile in this. You know, he's had vile moments leading up to this moment, but this is when he admits like, hey buddy, I'm not going anywhere. But what you need to understand is that I am here to stay. You can try to run, hide, ignore me, push me away, but you can't. You haven't yet, and you won't. And it's brilliant because Bob brings out this insane intensity to the scene and, and it's just, it, it's, it gives me goosebumps, you know, watching it and thinking about it because it's just this scary, scary moment where you think for a moment, oh shit, he might be right. Like even no one thinks that, like he might be right. This might be it for me. You naive, ignorant, arrogant, dumbass. There is no you without me, and you know it. I am your shadow. I am your breath. I am your every thought. And trust me, buddy, this is probably the only relationship you will ever have that you won't lose, no matter how hard you try to fuck it up. And then Nolan gives uh, a very, very impassioned speech where he finally after all this time, fully opens up. He explains it in every specific detail, how he feels, what has caused this, how it feels to feel numb, how he admits that he feels like he has no reason to live anymore, how people in his past have hurt him so much to just, you know, raise this thing that is, you know, gnawing at his heart and gnawing at his brain and everything. Um, he lays it out all on the line. This is what life is supposed to be like. I shouldn't be sitting up at night wondering if anybody would care if I was gone. Or when I find someone special in my life. I shouldn't be worried if they're talking about me behind my back or, or cheating on me or doing everything they can to ruin my life and break my heart. 
I always end up blowing things so high that people end up doing the things I'm afraid of because, because they can't take it anymore. And I can't blame them. I have no way of dealing with this. I have no way of, of countering the pain I feel every damn day. This moment, this speech and monologue is something that I consider both the easiest thing I've ever written and the hardest thing I've ever written. Early on in the writing process, I knew there was going to be this sort of confrontation between Sam and and, uh, and no one, even though I don't, I think it, back then it was like, you know, Luke and dark figure, like there was no, you know, specific name for depression. But I wrote this monologue and this speech and it all came very naturally to me. And there's a reason for that. I find with my own life that it's easier for me to use film as a way for me to speak and a way for me to say things that maybe I, I genuinely want to say in real life. I just don't have the courage to do it. I'm just not brave enough to say these things in real life. And it's ironic to me because of what this film is about. This film is called Afraid to Speak for a reason. It's about a man who's dealing with depression who is afraid to talk about depression. And I always found it very ironic that the, the, the scene where our character who's dealing with depression finally opens up and lays it out all on the line was the easiest thing I've ever written, but also the hardest thing I've ever written because it was, it was not from Nolan's voice. from mine and I think that's why it was the easiest and hardest thing because it was things that I wanted to say but I never could in real life and it was also the hardest thing to, to write because I had to dig deep and then and admit a lot of things and confront a lot of things and it it always scared the shit out of me to to see it on paper and know that someday we would film it and someday it would be out because it was so personal and I'm, I'm so happy that the person to perform these words was Taylor Olson because I don't think there's another person on, on this planet who could have performed it the way that we did and respected the words as much as he did and understood the words as much as I did writing them, uh, but also had the courage and bravery to perform them in a way that was so genuine to the original intent and the original origin of where they came from. The big reveal, obviously, at the end of the film is that uh, he's not talking to Sam. It seems like he is, and, and Sam's sort of taking it all in and letting him to all oh, go ahead, go get your speech out, whatever. But it ends up that, you know, Nolan is actually talking to Ellie, who's just behind Sam. And, and the moment that we reveal Ellie, Sam realizes what's going on. He's absolutely livid. He disappears, um, you know, for a brief moment uh, within Nolan's life. And we get to the core of the film, which is, you know, the title, Afraid to Speak. Uh, he, Nolan isn't afraid to speak anymore. He's saying it as it is. He's telling Ellie, somebody he loves and cares about, exactly what has been happening and how he feels. And because of that, he's able to take a step forward in understanding and, and, and confronting this thing that is controlling his life. I am so sorry for the way I was. I'm so sorry for what I did and I don't want you out of my life anymore. I need you to know that. Ellie, I'm sorry. For me, if, if this moment didn't work, I thought that the film would be useless. I thought that everything we built up to this point wouldn't, would have been for nothing, but this moment worked. And when I saw people see the film and they realized that Ellie was actually the one that he was talking to, I, I noticed that there was a, oh, thank God. You know, uh, oh, I was hoping she'd be there and I'm so happy she was. 
because I think a lot of people rallied behind this idea that that Nolan was simply hurting and, and him opening up was going to help him, which it ultimately does in the film. This moment worked. I will never be mad at you for dealing with this thing. You gotta know, you don't have to do it alone. So please, don't. It shows this unimaginable pain being alleviated and the man who's feeling this pain taking a step forward to understanding and confronting this thing that is just killing him. Uh, and it's, it's the point of the movie. Afraid to speak. He's not afraid to speak anymore. And I could not be happier with how it worked out. Paige as Ellie brought so much to the story. It, 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 it brought a different aspect of you know depression, each character sort of serving this, this different aspect. You have a uh, you have Bob obviously as depression, so that's sort of the core antagonist of what's going on. Bill and his mentality of how he'll get over it, you know, not in a in a in a mean spirited way, but maybe in a slight ignorance um, to the the total thing, which is not his fault because obviously you know the, the the understanding of this thing is is um, it's hard to grasp. But also you have, you have Ellie who's who's coming in this as somebody who is uh, very close to somebody dealing with this and there's a helplessness there. What do I do? You know, I see that you're hurting. I don't know what to do about this. Um, I know you can't snap out of it and I know that it's not your fault and all I want to do is help, but I don't know what to do. Um, I wish you would open up to me, but I, I also can't force you to open up. So it's, it's an entirely different point of view for this film and it, and it, and it works so well in contrast to Nolan's um, um, just loss of control to Sam. Paige brought a very unique, you know, aspect to this. She brought uh, an incredible work ethic. She brought an incredible talent, uh, acting talent. She got it. And conversations I've had over the years with her just about this film and about life and everything, it, it, it drives the point home that, you know, Ellie wouldn't have worked without Paige. Uh, I genuinely believe that. I, I don't think that there, there it would have been the same. And I, I think Paige brought such an honesty and genuine nature to the character and also a, a heartfelt understanding and, and, and generosity to Ellie that just would not have been possible in any other scenario. And I owe a lot to her for making this work and, and making up for a, a, a fairly immature writer who maybe didn't understand quite how to write certain roles at the time. Yeah. You know, Paige, Paige fixed Ellie, and because of that, Ellie works. Uh, and I, and I, and I, and this film owe so much to her work. The film ends with a bit of a wrap up and a voiceover, as uh, you know, Nolan explains what's going on, how he 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 dealt with this thing for so long that he gave it a name. But the most important aspect of this ending voiceover is that does he pop up from time to time? Yes. You know, this thing, this depression, didn't fully go away just because he opened up. But now he has a support system and a way to talk about it that now he's able to look at it and have a better management of this thing that he felt was originally uncontrollable and unbeatable in a way um, that he absolutely can never manage and never overcome and, and never be able to have a normal life because this was going to ruin every moment of his life. And uh, because of the support system he has and because of him finally opening up and, and admitting to somebody that he trusts and love. He gained the ability to confront this in a much more stable way uh, and, it, and it helped him. Um, but I thought it was also crucial to share that, you know, this didn't erase depression. Um, it simply helped him uh, grab control of it a little better than he had before um, so that he could move forward towards managing this and having a life where he could feel happy with a slight chance of heartache. So that was the main production. Um, something that <laughs> sort of on every level should not have worked. You know, we hit a lot of obstacles. Um, the fact that we had no money, uh, we had very limited time. Uh, we were doing this um, with everything against us, pretty much. Um, but 
just because of the determination of, of those involved and the the clear understanding of how important the subject matter was we we managed to get done what i consider something very special um something that was punching above its weight class and had no right to work as well as it did and that was because of the crew and the cast that we had um, without them this would not have happened you know without the support of the cast this never would have happened without the support of the crew uh, allowing me to, to make this thing happen. I mean, I, if filmmaking is not a one-person job. You know, there's, there's no arrogance in the world that could convince me that I could do this on my own um, without people who are willing to go that extra mile and, and just give it their all uh, for the sake of the story. You know, not a, selfish, um, not a selfish thing, not something only for them, but for the story of the film. Um, these things don't happen without that and I, and I can't thank everybody involved enough um, for making this work way better than it ever had any right to be. You know, a film that started out as a, as a silly, immature, cheating storyline turned into something that I thought it was very powerful in a lot of ways.